Well, I'm still singing the fourth verse in my head right now, okay? So <laughs> it counts. Gospel of Luke, please. Gospel of Luke in chapter number 22, please. Okay. I, I hope you are more eager to hear God's word now than you were 30 minutes ago even. Luke 22. And then let's, um, let's pray. And so, God, now we pray again. And this prayer is very specific for us now because this is your word we're opening up. And we're, we're petitioning you to, to work in our life through your word that is powerful and through your spirit. We're doing that because we need your work. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You know, you know the term buyer's remorse. Some of you are already smirking like I know that term. <laughs> I've experienced that plenty of times. I, I, I am, my nature is a saver, not a spender, so I don't experience buyer's remorse that much. But there's been a few times where I, I, I know exactly what that term means. For me, like a few years ago, I, for years in my very small golf game, I used the same 1990s hand-me-down driver that I picked up at a used sports store. But after using that driver for so many years, I finally began to believe the advertisements that I would see that if I got a new driver, my golf game would just transform. That's what they said. And so I, 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 I dropped the money, and I drive with my new driver to the driving range with visions in the back of my head of people just stopping their practice to look at me drive because they're so impressed with what I'm doing with my new driver. I mean, there, there's, I mean, I knew it was distant, but there's still a few thoughts through my head thinking, maybe career change is coming, you know? I mean, could be professional golf in my future with this new driver. If it does, what do they say it's supposed to do? You know what my new driver didn't help me do? Make it to professional PGA Tour. You know what my driver didn't do? Lower my score one shot. <laughs> you know what my driver did do? Wish I had the price I paid for the driver back. I know exactly buyer's remorse. I am convinced that there are numerous Christians who genuinely believe that Jesus Christ has buyer's remorse when it comes to saving them from their sins. I'm convinced that many Christians believe that Jesus does love in a general sense. But when the statement is made personal, they wonder if it's still true. I'm convinced that there are so many Christians who think of Jesus' love as something that is past tense that happened at salvation, but there have been so many years now with so many sins and so many failings and so many decisions that completely fall flat on their face within 24 hours that they, they, that they just believe that somehow Jesus Christ has gotten tired of them probably. That his patience is probably wearing a little thin That he has buyer's remorse when it comes to saving you. You wonder if you've so wrecked your life, you've so messed it up, that Jesus doesn't really love you anymore, that maybe at most what you get from Jesus is an apathetic shoulder shrug. And when this thinking permeates our life, what happens is we are, we, we give into cynicism and empty Christianity. We can sing praises that are theologically true, but genuinely have a hard time placing them into our lives as real. And we run on spiritual fumes because why worship a God that we're not even convinced still loves us? Why serve a God that we think is as frustrated with us as we are with the 17th phone call we got that day telling us that our auto warranty is about to expire? That's how Jesus must feel about me. So this morning what I want us to see is how Jesus responds to his closest followers 
who abandoned him at his most suffering-filled moment so that we can see Jesus' heart and see the reality that Jesus does not regret redeeming you. He still loves you. See, this is an, this, to me this morning, my argument is an argument from the greater to the lesser. If I can see how Jesus Christ is going to respond to an individual who will turn his back at his greatest moment of suffering, who will take a nap when his Savior is agonizing, and I can see how Jesus will respond to this individual, then I know Jesus' heart to me. Would you read with me? I'm in Luke 22. I'm going to start reading in verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter had said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. And he said to them, but now let, me, let, let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors for what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. Now, some of you followed along and you were engaged enough and you said, there's some odd stuff going on here. So let's just, we're going to boil it down to where I hope we end up at the end of this. That you're telling yourself as you leave today, Jesus does not regret redeeming me. He loves me. Now, we're going to do this not through just the first verse and the next verse and the next verse, verse by verse order. We're going to do this theological order. So we're going to jump in to verse number 35 first to see that Jesus' love for us leads to him purchasing us with his death. So his love, we, we establish his love for us is seen because he purchases us. Now the passage, we're still at the Last Supper. We're in the upper room. Jesus is having the last meal with his disciples. And he's preparing them now for a massive shift in how ministry is going to take place now. Because he knows what's coming. So he starts by drawing their attention back to when he sent them out before. So they've been on a ministry trip before. They got sent out by two by two. He sent out as many as 70 of his disciples to minister before. They've done amazing things. And so he jogs their memory and says, okay, now, you remember back in the day when, when I sent you out, I gave you some instructions like no money bag. That means you got no wallet, no credit cards. You got nothing. And then, like, no knapsacks. You're not even taking lunch for the, on the road, okay? You don't know. You got your breakfast. You left. You don't know what's happening for the next meal. I mean, he even gets down to that. You don't get to take sandals with you guys. Take the sandals off. And then he asks a question. I love the question. So when you started your ministry trip with zilch, did any of you guys lack anything? I love their answer. Nothing. We didn't lack anything. He's like, okay, good, good, good. All right, rule change now. Changing it up. Now I'm telling you to do the exact opposite. Take your money bag. All right, stock it up. Take your knapsack. Get ready for the trip. And in fact, actually, if you don't have a sword, why don't you go sell your cloak and you go get a sword? You see, he's, he's completely changed up the rules here now. I'm sending you out again. You're going to minister, but test, guess what now? You, you make yourself prepared for this. All right. Now, some of you, because I know, man, I, I know how boys are. We got to a sword part in the passage. I got three boys in my house. Boys had the ability to make anything an imaginary or actual real weapon, okay? This week in my house, a pine cone was a gun. It was a weapon, all right? It didn't do much damage, but it was there. So when we got to this verse and it said, Jesus Christ says, you guys get yourself some swords. Some of you guys are like, whoa. 
I mean, some of you are already planning in the car on your way home to nudge your wife, and you're like, you, you hear Pastor's sermon today. We should go by Cabela's. Cabela, shouldn't we? Probably need to stock up on a few new weapons, okay? God said so. Let's balance this, okay? See, I, I need to say let's balance this because in a few moments, Jesus is going to be in a garden, and he's going to get betrayed. And one of his disciples is going to show that he either needs to take remedial sword fighting skills classes or he has crazy good aim. And he was aiming for a guy's ear because he chops off a guy's ear. And Jesus' response isn't, man, I am so glad I told you to grab some swords before we left. His response in the Gospel of Matthew is, dude, put your sword away. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. So I'm, I got to kind of balance what's going on here. And if I keep on reading through the New Testament, I don't get pictures of, of Peter and, and James sword fighting their way through Asia Minor. I get pictures of Peter sitting in a prison. Paul sitting in a prison. So what's Jesus doing here? He is very frankly telling them, Something big is going to change everything for you and how you minister. If you look at verse number 37, he actually connects this, this thought. For I tell you. So I'm telling you to do this to prepare for ministry. Why? Because I tell you this is what's going to happen here. In just a moment, something's going to change everything. And now you're not individuals just ministering to some people telling them the Messiah has come. Now you're going to minister to a world that sees what this Messiah actually means and they're going to hate it and reject it. So you be prepared as you go out to minister for me. So what changes everything? Verse 37. And he, Jesus, was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. He was counted with the sinful lawbreakers. He was, he was grouped with those who's broken the law. If we were dividing up teams, and instead of saying, you know, eight-year-olders on this year, nine-year-olders on this team... We would say, okay, so all you vile, wicked, wretched sinners on this side. Oh, Jesus, yeah, Jesus, you're with them. Okay, over there. If we were taking a survey, and we got to the question, sinner or sinless, we look at Jesus, oh yeah, we know which one you are, sinful. There we go. He is grouped with the sinful. And that's what happens. He is betrayed like a sinner. He is taken into custody like a sinner. He is tried like any run-of-the-mill criminal. He is beaten like a criminal. He is mocked like any number of the thousands of individuals who have come through a Roman jail. He is hung like a criminal. He is hung with criminals. Now, if that is all that happened, and that is the extent of what it means for him to be numbered with the transgressors, we would have a very sad story, an unjust story, mistrial of the century story. But it wouldn't be enough for us to gather today. Because the phrase he was numbered with the transgressors can't just be a bunch of priests and Roman leaders treated him like a criminal. It has to also mean that God himself treated Jesus Christ like he was me. That is what means Jesus Christ was counted with the transgressors. That God himself would treat Jesus Christ as if he was one of us. A transgressor. This is who Jesus Christ is. And this is my only hope. 
It is, it is Jesus Christ paying the penalty for my sin. Jesus Christ becoming the transgressor so that you and me, the transgressors of God's righteous law, could be counted righteous. If you want a good theological term, here it is today. Imputation. Okay? My sin is imputed. It is placed upon Jesus Christ. And what did I get? I get his righteousness placed upon me. Why? Because another big theological word. Substitutionary atonement. He is the substitute who dies in my place. This is Jesus Christ. And this is his love for us. That he would count himself as a sinner. That he would be treated as a sinner. So that I could have righteousness. You here today. Every one of you here today. That is your only hope. For a relationship with God and forgiveness of your sins. That's it. There's not like option two like, pastors, like, is this a multiple choice? Like, a few of them are correct answers? No, this is it. Your sin must be paid for. You say, that doesn't seem really nice. Holy God must judge sin or he's not holy. He's a corrupt judge then. So holy God must judge sin. So the two options are either he judges your sin through you, which is eternity in hell, Or he judges your sin on Jesus Christ's death upon the cross. Those are the two it's. So then the call of Jesus Christ is, I have have died. I've been treated as a transgressor, even though I've lived a perfect life. So here's your option then. Repent of your sin and place your faith in Jesus Christ alone. I say the word alone like every Sunday, don't I? And I say the word alone every Sunday because we, we, man, we love to make it like Jesus Christ and, and like Jesus Christ and this. Oh, yeah, I, I hear you on the Jesus Christ thing, Pastor, but I've been baptized too, so that's got to count, count for something. I hear you on the Jesus Christ thing, but you know how many times I have gone to a church service? I'm glad I did that and helped out Jesus Christ on that one a little bit. That is why I say Alone. It is God, all I bring into this transaction is the filthy rags of my sin. And apart from your grace, I am helpless today. And so I cry out to you as the only hope of salvation for my sins. That Jesus Christ would die for me. Now, you just tell me you're here still. Amen? We're on the same page still? Honestly, I think that's the easy part for us Christians. I I grew up hearing the gospel. We come each Sunday, we sing the gospel. And so to get to this point, we say, oh yeah, Jesus loves me. He died for me. Amen. But what about today? Right? But but what about now that I have, I mean, I've messed up a lot, Pastor. And so, yeah, Jesus saved me, but he probably is not too excited about what he did because I haven't really, I haven't done that good. Jesus Christ does not regret redemption. See, he doesn't just purchase us because he loves us. What we see in the passage before what I just read is how he treats those individuals he knows are going to fall. Can we just go here for a second? Let's just, we're going to go here. Newsflash. Jesus Christ is not surprised that you still sin after salvation. Some of you are smirking. (laughs) He's not. He's God. Do you realize the foundational aspect of buyer's remorse is that we have expectations that are greater than what we actually get? So my, my expectations for a golf driver is that I'm going to drive 350 yards with ease, bending it around the brake. 
And reality was I'm still shaking 175. Therefore, I have buyer's remorse. What is Jesus Christ's expectations when he saved us? That we were just going to be these epitome of perfect individuals singing hallelujah chorus to him 24-7. No, he knew we were going to sin. He actually told us we're going to sin. And guess what? You're going to do it again this week. I'm not giving you a license toward this, okay? Please don't hear this. Like, oh, well, the pastor says it's inevitable, so let's just go give it a whirl. That's what I'm saying. But I am saying it's a reality of a sin-cursed world that I am still a broken individual. And Jesus Christ knew it. See, I can, go, let's go to the passage here. Jesus Christ knows. Peter, verse 34. Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Straight up, I know what you're going to do. And how we view Jesus to us is, therefore then Jesus should just throw us out now. <laughs> I mean, I messed up again. There is no way God wants to hear the same prayer of confession for the thousandth time this year. Why bother? Here's Jesus Christ, and he knows exactly what Peter's going to do in the next few hours. That he is going to be scared stiff about a servant girl asking him a question of association. And you know what he doesn't do? Simon, I've had it with you. Like after three years, after what I'm going to do on the cross, you're not going to do better than this in this moment? I've had it with you. Just get out of here. You're a better fisherman than a disciple, okay? So stick to fishing. What does he do? Jesus' love for us leads him to praying for us. What does he do? He does not reject Peter. There is not an ounce in the passage that says that he, re, that he regrets what he's about to do to redeem them. He actually prays for them. Simon, verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Wouldn't that be a sobering statement in the middle of a meal? Simon, by the way, you are on Satan's hit list tonight. Okay, these guys, what were they just, what was the topic of conversation just a few seconds ago? You guys remember? Who's the greatest? Oh man, I bet, I bet I rank pretty high up on that list, Jesus. Simon, shut up. This is what's actually happening right now. Satan's making plans to take you down. <laughs> Simon, right now, and actually the statement is you, it's actually plural. I, I think he's talking about all the disciples. Satan wants to knock them all off. The picture I get with what's going on right now is Simon and the disciples are like, are like those fat zebras on the nature shows. Okay? And they are just having the time of their life eating the, grass, the great grass. And then the, the, the narrator, who invariably will have a British accent talking in a whisper behind the background, starts whispering about the lion that's in the grass coming up, talking about the flow of nature and how one person has to go home hung, I mean, hungry tonight. And, and maybe just, you get enthralled and then they're oblivious to it. And you're watching like, dude, there's a lion right there. You got to get going, guys. That's what's happening in this passage. You guys are here chewing the fat in your prideful conversation about who's the best. Don't you know what's happening behind your back? Satan making a plea to have a play at your life. Peter learned the lesson. He learned it. I don't think it's by accident that Peter's the one who tells us in 1 Peter 5, your adversary is like a roaring lion Seeking whom he may devour. He learned his lesson. <laughs> he learned it. Christian, just side note. There are too many days that we wake up with a peacetime mentality that everything's okay. There is not a day we don't wake up in a war zone. We wake up every day in a spiritual war zone with an adversary 
with casualties and with a battle. And too often we wake up thinking everything's going to be okay because it's just sunshine and roses. And we're oblivious that there is danger within us and outside of us. Every day we walk with Christ. Now, if that was the simple equation, we wouldn't have hope today. But I love Jesus' statement here. Satan's making a demand. He wants you. Does Satan get his demand? No. Satan has to submit to Almighty God. Read the book of Job. What happens in this passage? Satan wants to sift them like wheat. It's, it's an amazing picture. It is he wants to take you and toss you up in the air and the wind will catch away and it will blow away the chaff and it will separate the chaff from the wheat head. It's the picture of Satan wants to shake you around and separate you from your faith. Man, I love, I love, I love Peter's response. Verse 33 Don't worry, it, Jesus. Jesus, I got this. Okay? I mean, yeah, Satan's got his thing, Jesus. And I mean, I don't care. Like, every one of these other guys, they might back out on you. Okay? They just might, just saying it. But you know me. To the death, Jesus. We're in this one together. I'm going all the way with you, Jesus. Man, I am. Okay. There's a lot of things once we get to eternity that we, I want to do. A lot of us need to go up and thank Peter, okay? Because Peter is a lot of us. Here's Peter. Peter, Satan wants you. I got it, God. I got this. I got this handled. His self-confident reliance upon who he is. There is no like, oh, Jesus, help me. It's a... No problem. So many of us, so many of us are convinced that the recipe for spiritual growth is more effort on our own. When we hear a sermon, we think, yeah, I need to do better. I got it. Man, this week, whew. This week, they better watch out. I mean, like, I'm going from zero times in God's word to like 27 times in God's word. Just going to book up the week. I got this. So many times we, we hear it and we're like, okay, I'm going to do better. Anger, this week, not going to have it. You know how long that lasts? To the stupid person that doesn't know a four-way stop on our way home. And it all goes out the window. Literally, as we yell out the window. And we're so convinced. I got, I'm going to do better this time. I made my decision. I, I, I've got this one. Christian, your sanctification is, yes, your effort, but it is your effort to run to Christ, to rely on Christ, to walk in Christ, to abide in Christ, to run to the gospel. Your sanctification and growth is never, you got this, go try harder. That's what Peter's going to do. And Jesus says, guess what, Peter? Let me just tell you how one's going to work out. Um, there's going to be a rooster that's going to crow soon. And that's going to be a little trigger alarm in your head. When that happens, by that point, you're already going to deny me three times. Peter, you are going to fall flat on your face spiritually. You're going to be ashamed. And the person that you just said you're going to go to jail with and you're going to die with, you will deny you even know him within about 12 hours. Jesus knows exactly what Peter's going to do. He knows how much Peter's going to fall. He knows the statements that Peter is going to make to deny that he even knows Jesus Christ. Peter is going to fall asleep as Jesus Christ cries great drops of blood as he prays out in the garden. 
all the disciples are going to run in a few moments when Jesus Christ is betrayed. And then they'll finally make it to a courtyard, those that are still left. And Jesus knows he'll be denied to where all that remains is himself. He'll be abandoned. They'll turn his back on him. He knows it. How does he respond? Peter, Satan has demanded to have you, to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. I have pleaded for you that your faith remains. You know how sweet it is to get one of those notes in the mail someday? You know, it's having the bad day and God just knows to work it out where you get the note in the mail and just from one of your friends and says, you know, just letting you know I'm praying for you. We're in a techie day now, so you probably just get the text message or you get, get on your Facebook message wall. You're kind of like, hey, dude, someone's praying for me. And it's just that kind of encouragement. As long as you truly trust the person's praying for you, it's not one of those like 27, like, oh yeah, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. You actually know they mean it. Like, thank you. Peter just gets one of those notes from Jesus Christ himself. Peter, you were on my prayer list this morning. I prayed for you. Father, I'm bringing my child Peter to you now. And I'm pleading for him in this moment. (laughs) He thinks he can handle this. But we know he can. He's going to fall, God. He's going to deny you. But I pray that his fall will not crush his faith. I pray for him. That Satan does not succeed. I plead that his faith remains. How does Jesus even finish that prayer? Like I smile and I, I don't mean to jest in this. My prayers have to end as Jesus Christ has mentioned. I pray through Jesus Christ's name. I pray in his name. So I finish my prayers in Jesus' name. Jesus doesn't have to finish his prayers in Jesus' name. He's Jesus. As only begotten Son of God, I ask this. Now let's just stop here. What, what does Jesus not pray for? I think, it's, I think it's important for us to see this. What does he not pray for? He does not pray for a lot of things that we wish he'd pray for. He does not pray that Satan won't tempt Peter. Could he have? Yep. Does he? Nope. In his sovereignty, they say, the Trinity here... Peter, we will give Satan this opportunity. This one surprises me. Jesus doesn't even pray that Peter won't sin. That there is somehow this wisdom that says Peter needs to see his own human frailty to know how much desperate he is in need of God's grace in his life, that he will rely upon me, not his own strength. And so, God, we will take him to a point where he breaks to see he doesn't. He can't do it on his own. You know what Jesus doesn't pray? Would you just bless Peter today and just have him have a great day and just, like, man, just just really encourage his heart today. I pray his faith would remain. I think some of us are sitting back and saying, yeah, that's Peter, but man, I'd be nice if God would pray for me. Consequently, he, Jesus, is able to save. The utmost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. 1 John 2, we have an advocate with God the Father. Who's the advocate we have? Jesus Christ going between us and God. Isaiah 53, he makes intercession. He prays for us. Christian, please, would you take this moment just to say, wait a minute here. Not only does Jesus Christ not, re, not, 
not have remorse that he redeems me. He does not regret redemption. But in the moment that I would think that Jesus Christ is so frustrated and so ready to give up on me, what he is actually doing is interceding before God the Father for me. He prays for me. Not my words, but words that I was encouraged by this week. If only we could see Jesus and listen to what he's saying to the Father. Wouldn't you love to eavesdrop a little bit? What courage would take our lives to live for him through every trouble in life? Jesus is praying for us that our faith would not fail. He is praying about our chronic pain, that in our physical weakness we will not stop trusting in the goodness of God. He is praying about our troubled marriages, that in our alienation we will not stop trusting in his love. He is praying about our financial situation, that in our urgent concern about paying the bills we will not stop trusting in God to provide. He is praying about our secret discouragements, that in our dark of dark nights despair we will not stop trusting him to lead us into the light. He is praying about our wandering into sin that we will never stop trusting his forgiveness that he purchased. Jesus does not regret redemption. He loves. And his love leads to him interceding for you this week, brother and sister. What does his love lead us to do? Lastly, and we're done, Jesus' love leads to him positioning us for service for him even after we fail him. So Jesus knows, Peter, you're going to deny me. In fact, it's going to be three times. You're going to make a royal mess, Peter. Let's just put it that way. But I love what he says here. Verse 32, end of it. And when you have turned again, When you have repented, Jesus knows his prayer is going to be answered. His faith will remain. So when you repent, you got a job to do, Peter. I'm not putting you in the penalty box. Go strengthen your brothers. You got a task to do, Peter. Because you're going to have 10 other of your brothers that have walked away and they will be hurting. Your job, once you repent, you go get busy ministering. Christian, please smile. Here is my Savior who's about to endure the cross, knowing that the people he's dying for aren't even going to make it a few hours before they start sinning and denying him. Not only knowing that, but actually preparing them for service after they've sinned. Peter, I'm not going to be done with you. You're not put on the back burner. You have a job to do. And in fact, the job you're going to do is a leadership role in ministering to your brothers in need. This shouldn't surprise us. We go through Scripture and we see over and over again that God graciously saves us, graciously redeems us, and graciously uses us. I mean, 1 Corinthians, if you want to feel really good about yourself, Paul says, guess what? God didn't choose a whole bunch of wise and gifted people. (laughs) He chose the low. So it's not even about who I am that God says, yep, going to use you. And then you keep on going through Scripture, and you see that who he uses are a bunch of broken individuals who mess up. All right. I know. I know that Satan tempts us to despair. And hangs the sin over our lives. And we know that it's not like normally acceptable, so we don't talk about it. But so often we become convinced. 
that with God, who knows how many strikes and you're out, but it really doesn't matter because we passed that limit a long time ago. And we'll sing of his love and we can look at our kids and say, Jesus loves you, and we believe that. But if we were asked specifically, does Jesus Christ love you in this moment right now in your life? Many times we would pause. And many times we would say, I'm not sure. It doesn't, doesn't feel like it. Christian, this is such a dangerous place to be at. Why serve a God you're not even convinced still loves you? Why run to him? Why even turn from your sins if you know what you're going to be greeted by is just contempt? Jesus Christ does not regret redeeming you. He does not have buyer's remorse for saving you from your sin. And in fact, today his love is just as true as when in eternity past he said, I will have a relationship with you. Because every falling you have done in your entire life did not shock your Savior one second. He knew it. So what does he do then? He prays for you. And he places you in position to serve him. So what then do we do? We run to him. We embrace him. We confidently turn from our sin because of his love for us and with boldness run back to our Savior over and over and over again because we know who we are running to is a person with endless love that that day has been praying and interceding for us. He does not regret us. He loves us. Would you pray? And so God, now we pray and we thank you for your word in our life. And we take the moment that we need right now, Father, to think through your word and, and I take the moment to challenge those who've listened to your word now. To begin with, I just challenge those who've listened and you say, wait a minute here. You stress the word only, and I've known for a long time Jesus Christ, but that word only is not what I've known. And I welcome you, I, I, I urge you. You are faced with the reality of having to pay for, the, for your own sin for all of eternity, or looking to Jesus Christ as the only payment of your sin, to turn from your sin and trust in him alone. And I urge you to do that today. There are, there are dozens of people who would love to talk to you today. Pray with you today. But Christian, my action point today is so simple. I want us to see a love from our Savior that warms our heart and challenges us to run to him with confidence. Do you really believe that Jesus Christ loves even after the week you just had? And so in Jesus' name we pray. And we thank you in your name. Amen.